Welcome to Dermatologically Tested, the podcast of the British Association of Dermatologists, aka the BAD. On this podcast, we'll be exploring the world of our skin with a range of dermatological experts, tackling topics from the clinical to the cosmetic. I'm Matt Gass, and with me is Nina Goad, Head of Communications at the BAD. Today, we'll be talking about anti-aging and cosmetics labelling. Hi, Nina. You looking forward to another episode? Yeah, I am. Hi, Matt. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting one, actually. I think it's not for everyone because I think there are plenty of people who aren't especially concerned about skin aging and neither should they be. It is a natural process. But also there are plenty of people for whom it is a big deal and they don't want to age before their time and they're not massively keen on their wrinkles. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to an expert who can sort of unpick some of the issues around what you can do to minimise aging if it's an issue for you what your cosmetics labeling means you know things like natural organic dermatologically tested that sort of stuff I think it could be an interesting subject for us today. As you say yes it's a natural process but I think people often get hung up on this idea that you shouldn't be vain or or whatever but you know I think that's that's quite unfair. It's hard not to really worry about things like skin aging when you're kind of bombarded with messaging telling you it's it's not a, a good thing you forget actually that it isn't the be all and end all. Definitely, definitely. On another note, my number one anti-aging technique this week was, and this won't apply to everybody, but shave off your beard because I found that took five or so years off off my age at least. <laughs> well, that's the first thing I'm going to do after we finish recording that. I'm going to go get rid of my beard, see <laughs> yeah. if it works for me too. <laughs> really helpful, really yeah. helpful for me. Good to know. I do have a question about your beard. Do you have a tan line now? Does half your face look darker than the other half? Well, luckily, I don't spend too much time in the sun and I don't tan much. So it, it's ever so slightly lighter, but it's not to the point where it's embarrassing. It's not like a full on tan line. People aren't tuning in to, to hear about my beard or lack thereof. So I think it's time for our guest. Our guest is Dr. Bav Shergill and Bav is a consultant dermatologist. He's also a past president of the British Cosmetic Dermatology Group. He currently leads the BAD Skin Cancer Prevention Committee, so I'm sure we're going to hear plenty about protecting your skin from the sun, which is obviously important for skin cancer, but also in terms of skin ageing too. So Bav, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, guys. So just to start off, when we talk about skin ageing, what exactly are we referring to? Well, see, skin ageing covers quite a few different aspects. I mean, we have an inbuilt body clock. We have an intrinsic aging process. Things happen on the inside that we really can't avoid. And if you want to break that down, as you get older, your bones resorb a little bit. So your your height of your, your teeth looks a bit different. Your fat levels get less. Your face starts to hang a little bit because you haven't got as much fat pushing it out and making it all nice and perky. And your collagen starts to thin out a little bit too. You get some fine lines appearing in your skin. Those are intrinsic aging signs. But then we've also got extrinsic aging, aging that happens because of things that we do and environments that we expose ourselves in. Uh, For example, the sun can cause a lot of damage on the skin. It can cause reactions that lead to thinning of collagen, to destruction of those elastic fibers that give our skin that little ping and Without those fibres, you end up getting wrinkles and sagging. You also get pigmentation problems, blotchiness and redness on your face. So you lose that lovely skin tone that you had when you were younger. And those are extrinsic factors. That's just the sun alone. Another key extrinsic factor would be smoking. Smoking really seriously damages your skin and causes excessive ageing. You're looking at different studies. It almost causes 10 years of extra ageing when you look at adults around the world, all different skin types. That's really interesting. So looking at both intrinsic and extrinsic um, skin ageing, which you've mentioned, what would you say are the main causes of skin ageing within those groups? And and do they differ for different skin types? It's interesting about different skin types. You've got very fair skin, uh, pale redheads going all the way down to people who have very dark skins. And it's interesting, culturally, those cultures can all identify and age people within their culture. So we, what we think makes people look younger in Europe is very different to what people, what ageing signs there are, say, in Southeast Asia or in Africa. But if you're looking at what's going to cause ageing across all people, 
extrinsically, it has to be the sun as your number one. Um, so excessive sun exposure uh, causes all kinds of damage into the skin, um, it causes uh, free radicals to be released, which cause they damage all the important structures in your skin and in the top layer of the skin as well, as well as increasing blotchy pigmentation. That affects your complexion. You also get increase of vessels because your body's trying to repair the damage. And this gives you kind of ready blotches as well. The mixture of the two make you look very weathered. Losing your collagen is like taking the stuffing out of a mattress. It all looks saggy and a bit limp. So again, uh, the collagen gets damaged due to excessive sun exposure, as well as some intrinsic factors. I really wish somebody had uh, spoken to me when I was 18 and maybe, <laughs> you know, got me to throw away the cigarettes and step out the sun for once. Uh, Matt, you still got it, mate. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Very kind. And it's interesting. While, yes, you, you know... You get a lot of people who look at aging and go, well, I've done the damage now with my fags and my sunshine. But actually, if you stop smoking, lead a healthy lifestyle, have good amounts of antioxidants in your system to mop up any of these damaging free radicals, suddenly you could get you stop that massive slide in your skin and you also give your skin the best, most optimum appearance. So, yeah, you know, what you take internally does affect how you look externally. Well, I have managed to, to get rid of the cigarettes, so that's something. <laughs> and it's never too late to start good habits, I suppose. I think we, my generation, we associated having a tan with looking healthy. You know, I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, um, and we're sort of all paying the price now. But I now know also that, you know, after you've got a tan, your skin goes very dry and that can make your skin look older just you know on a very temporary level so there are benefits from getting out the sun even at, a, at an older age even if you think the damage is done oh absolutely for sure i mean it's interesting when you take away sun exposure and you have good sun habits we know this from looking at patients with skin cancer that you dramatically reduce their chances of getting further skin cancers and that's a good marker for showing damage to the skin from sun exposure so it does work and it is properly dermatologically tested so bav in your view what are the most important things that we can do to protect ourselves from skin aging that's a really good question and i'm going to be very brief because it's simple number one have good sun habits all right don't go out and burn your, your skin don't try off and say oh well i have to go red before i get a tan no you don't that's sunburn leading to, to pigmentation problems if you can stop doing that that's a big win between 11 and 3, wear a hat if you have to go out and make sure you use SPF 50, which is a sun protection factor. And also make sure that your sunblock has UVA protection as well. And it's all marked on the side there. Uh, those are the easy wins that you can do day in, day out. And I think, you know, that's a very simple message to put through. The other side of it would also be what you take internally. So if you drink a lot of alcohol, for example, you were talking about dehydration earlier. If you take a lot of alcohol in, uh, you dehydrate your skin, You look, your skin looks tired and flaccid. Um, also, you get a lot of problems with uh, broken vessel because you, the vessels in your skin dilate and open when you drink alcohol. And that can cause red blotches and lead to things like rosacea becoming a lot worse. So yeah, get rid of the alcohol. Make sure you have a good diet full of antioxidants. Antioxidants. Uh, they, what they do is they mop up horrible free radicals that are produced as a result of light you know, photochemical reaction from the sun in your skin and the things that cigarettes can do to your body. You know, very simple. You know, if I was making that, make sure you have a good diet and, you know, and don't, don't burn your skin in the sun. So just to recap, when you say no alcohol, <laughs> how strict are we being here? Are you talking about, you know, problem levels of drinking or are we OK to have, you know... <laughs> a few glasses a week because <laughs> I think I'd rather look old than give up wine to be, to honest, be honest if you drink enough wine you don't care what you look like frankly <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so for the purposes of science the purposes of science um looking at some of the review articles uh in the literature you, you come across you know some theories that say well actually having clear uh grain alcohol is better like for example, going for vodka rather than going for whiskey. But I think, you know, stick to your government guidelines in terms of how many units you have. 
it's just to be mindful. The sun, I think, is a bigger factor. I don't know. Let's let's put a very stark example. You've got uh, you've got a set of twins, right? And they're twenty, and one of them smokes and drinks quite a lot, and the other one drinks a little bit and smokes not at all, but also protects their skin in the sun. I can tell the difference in my clinic at the age of twenty-five. All right, so five years later, I can see the difference. Wow, wow. I can tell it on their faces. It's easy uh, to see those early lines around the mouth, to see those uh, bits of damage around by the eyes sallow you know, coloration on the skin and you know the way that the tan causes blotchiness and pigmentation you start to see that at 25 you'll see so many people at that age who've got damage to their skin and it's interesting about 80 percent of all the sun damage you get in your lifetime usually happens by the age of 20 so you know good habits need to start early and you can see these signs by the age of 30 those same set of twins all their friends can see the difference between the two so if you put that, it affects people and it affects people sooner than you think, the signs of extrinsic aging. So interesting. I mean, you know, from the BAD's perspective, we're usually talking about sun exposure in the context of skin cancer. Uh, but we do talk about skin aging quite a lot because it's, it's a message that, sort of, that people can relate to. And, and, you know, not many people think they're going to get cancer, whereas people have a slightly better understanding that, yes, they, their skin will age and they do want to prevent it from happening. But I think that you sometimes get a bit of pushback because people don't really necessarily want to hear that it's the lifestyle changes so much as here's a cream that you can use. Here are five products that if you put on your face every day will make an incredible difference. And I totally I relate to that as well, because, you know, frankly, it's it's a lot easier for me to proactively do something I find than to stop doing bad habits that i enjoy um, I, I reckon actually the, the the aging message is really useful because you do see the difference across your 20s and it's something that's tangible and it's a marker why why wait to get a skin cancer to know whether you've had a, too much sun exposure it's a bit late by then uh whilst you can reduce your risk going forward you know what it's a pretty traumatic thing to go through at any time of your life and you know, you have to remember that melanoma is uh one of the fastest um well, the, the incidence of melanoma is increasing rapidly in the 18 to 35 age group. And that needs to be mindful. I think it's like the second commonest skin cancer in that age group. Or sorry, it's the second commonest cancer full stop in that age group. And that's something that we need to be bear in mind, that those effects of sun damage do happen a lot earlier than people think. Yeah, that's a really good point, Bab. And I think it's something that young people should be aware of. Before we move on to talking about product labelling and claims made by cosmetic products, I'd love to get your thoughts on moisturising. I think for a lot of my male friends, moisturisers are pretty much the only product that they'd consider using on their faces for anti-aging purposes. But I guess my question is, do they actually have anti-aging properties or is it more a case that you should use them for general skin health? That's, I mean, I think it's really interesting that you bring that up because your skin does look younger, uh, more youthful if it's well moisturised. You know, if you want to make yourself look knackered, you just definitely don't moisturize and dehydrate yourself. So moisturizers make you look younger, full stop. OK, if you have a well moisturized skin, it's a good idea. In terms of actually increasing collagen thickness and, you know, kind of scientific signs, there was one study actually looking at a, a product which did seem to actually improve the, the amount of collagen that was in the skin and seemed to improve those kind of there's kind of biological signs of aging. Um, but you know what? I think it's a great thing to have a moisturizer that you use and get on with because it gives you good skin health and allows your skin to repair if it gets irritated or inflamed, like it does all the time for everybody. Do you need to use a moisturizer even if you don't have dry skin though? So for, I know, you know, men in particular, I have to say, I know several men who just have never used a moisturizer. They never would. It's just not something they would think to do. And I have to say, I think their skin looks pretty fine. It look doesn't they don't look older than I would expect them to look for their actual age. So is it more that if you've got dry skin, you should use a moisturizer? Or do you think that this is something that everyone should be doing if they are concerned about aging? If they're not, then don't bother if you mm. don't want to. That's good. That's, that's interesting. When it comes to men aging and women aging, it's you can't benchmark men versus women for the same age groups. If you look at your peer group, you just have to accept that they age differently. There are so many things getting into play 
I didn't really go into too much about aging, but I think there's a definite uh, factor with pre and post menopausal skin, for example. Um, and you certainly, you know, you look at men in their early 40s and you look at women who are just about to go through their menopause, their skin changes massively. So, uh, yeah, m men are a whole little world in themselves in terms of their skin quality. And definitely as they get older, their skin gets drier and flakier and they would benefit from having, as Matt said earlier, about good habits. You know, a good a habit is to have a good, well moisturized skin after I shaved, uh, which, I, by the way, I did shave especially for this podcast. Don't really know why I did that, but that's a good habit. Uh, after I shaved, <laughs> um, I made sure I put moisturizer on. Uh, I'm going to go out for a bike ride after the podcast uh, to get to the office. I um, you know, made sure there's a bit of sun cream as well on there, tops of my ears especially. So it's getting men to acknowledge that they, you know good maintenance is it's just a good habit to get into. So I, I do recommend moisturizing the skin, especially you know you think about all the hand washing we're doing at the moment. Uh, because of uh, the conditions with the COVID-19. And by the way, I hope that this terribly, horribly dates this podcast in the years to come by mentioning that. But at the moment, we're doing a lot of hand washing and um, I'm having to moisturise my skin because otherwise you do, it gets irritated and chapped and sore. So just because you don't, you know, your skin looks good and in good, good condition doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to be like that. I think moisturising the bits that are exposed every day, hands and face, is a good idea. There you have it. Form good habits. So we've talked about anti-aging. It'd be great to, to have a bit of a chat about product labelling. I think for a lot of people, it's quite intimidating walking into shops nowadays where there's often a, a dazzling array of, of cosmetic products for sale. Unless you go in with a plan, I think you're often drawn in by, by packaging or claims being made on the packaging. So it'd be great to dig into some of the terminology used. I think it makes sense to tackle anti-aging first. And before we get started, I've actually got an extract from the Committees of Advertising Practice and their guidance on beauty claims. In isolation, describing a product as an anti-aging or an anti-wrinkle cream is unlikely to be a problem, especially if the context of the ad explains that the effects are temporary. So an ad that states that the cream can reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles is likely to be acceptable but an ad that states or implies that the product will have an anti-aging or an anti-wrinkle effect is not. I, I get what they're saying there. It seems a little counterintuitive at first, um, but essentially I, I think they're saying a bit like you were talking about with moisturizers is that, that they, they won't sort of, you know, increase your collagen or, or, or whatever it may be to increase the elasticity of your skin, but they will sort of hide wrinkles and pump out your skin a little bit if they're moisturizing, for example. Is that a fair reflection, do you think? Well, you know, Matt, you don't need to single out anybody. You should single out everybody, okay? Let's face it, the most of the packaging that you see and the claims that are made are about reducing the signs of ageing, okay? That is not reducing the ageing process itself. And you know what? If you plump out your skin with nice moisturiser or you find a way to hydrate it, uh, your skin will look good. Your lines will look a bit better. So, yeah, you it becomes very lawyer-like, doesn't it? in terms of the packaging. These are very experienced companies. They know how to package products to make them look medical or, or sciencey or futuristic according to the target demographic. Having said that, they are actually stuck in a bit of a bind because they all know about what medical products can improve the signs of aging. But if they did have them in there, then those products would be classed as medical and they'd have to be prescribed. Yes, yeah, so this is the distinction between cosmetic products and medical products. Cosmetic products can't make a medical claim, whereas medical products can only be available on prescription. And part of that is the ingredients that are within medical products, but part of it is also the concentrations, I believe. Yes, yeah, sorry, Matt. I realise that just nodding on a podcast isn't that effective. Yes, Matt, you're quite, <laughs> you're quite right. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of, um, you know, there's, a, there's quite a few products that dance on that line between being medical and cosmetic. They're just on the right side so they can sell their products over the counter. But a lot of the science background is actually quite reasonable uh, for what for these products that are out there. So I don't want to poo-poo or put a downer on the industry because actually a lot of the stuff is, is pretty good and based on sound science. It's just the fact that often they know, for example, they may not have the right concentration to get the same outcomes as the scientific research was using for their study. Do you know what I mean? So one has to 
you know, caution people to get too excited about science when that, the actual product itself isn't the same as what was used to see that effect. Yeah. Okay. So, so say a scientific study finds a, a, a new ingredient that has a big impact on, on your skin mm. health. Cosmetic products may not may have that ingredient and just not in the in the same. Yeah, we get that an awful lot. I mean, it's it sounds like this isn't you know saying to people you shouldn't buy these products that you can't get a, a use out of them because you know moisturizing your skin, keeping them healthy, reducing the appearance of wrinkles is what a lot of people want. It's just keep your expectations in check and 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 don't expect it to say have the same effect as a medical intervention. Yeah. I completely agree with you on that one, Matt, actually, because, yeah, and we can go through some examples if you like. Uh, so, for example, um, I prescribe a vitamin A-based compounds, a retinoic acid, in my cosmetic practice. Uh, this has been proven in, a stud- in, in you know, scientifically validated studies to increase the amount of collagen in the skin. It's really good. Uh, it also has a, um, a slight exfoliative effect, so it can get rid of dead skin cells, so your skin looks smoother. It can help rid of, get rid of pigmentation in that way. So again, your skin tone is more even. These are things that are the holy grail of the beauty industry, even skin tone. You think about the money spent on foundation to try and get even skin tone every year from people. So retinoic acid is fantastic, but you can't sell it over the counter. It has to be prescribed. But there is a derivative called retinol, which is a derivative of that, which does get processed into similar compounds in the skin, but just not at the same concentration. So it may have a good effect, but it will not be the same effect as you would see from the studies. Yeah, I think that's such an important distinction that you've made there, Bav, because I think a lot of people, and this is just talking to my friends, will say, well, why would I bother going to a dermatologist spending, you know, spending money when I can just get retinol if they're going to prescribe me this retinol? product I could just buy one off the shelf and I think people don't realize that the concentrations that you're going to get from a doctor when it's prescribed to you are completely different to the concentrations that you might find on a high street product and I don't think that that um, categorization has been made clear really I think people assume they hear a buzzword like retinoic acid or retinol and just assume that it's going to have the same effect wherever you get it from and that's a distinction I would personally like to see made a lot clearer. Yeah, but unfortunately, you've got to look at all the uh, vested interests in not promoting that particular message. It doesn't make a very sexy story, unfortunately, though it's the truth. As a dermatologist, I'm banging my head against the wall thinking, but, 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 but this stuff works. It's the most amazing thing. Why isn't everybody over the age of 40 using this? It's amazing. Um, and it works and it's scientifically proven and it's real and uh, tangible and not just snake oil. Uh, and, and yeah, Nina, I get frustrated about it. But then, you know, I get accused of having a vested interest. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Because he's the one who's going to be doing the prescription. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there are other things out there. Yeah. You know, if I was going to say other things that are very good for you, like vitamin B3, niacinamide, two, the two or three different things that niacinamide can do for your skin. It can reduce pigmentation. Okay, so you can reduce freckling, uh, and uh, also it uh, can have a protective effect against skin cancer. So that's a study that came out, um, I think, last year or the year before, uh, in a very large group of people. So there are things you can take that can do it, but the dosages has to be the same as what was in the study to get those effects. And you know, going to get a going to your high street health food store, you may not get the right com- you know concentration of compound to get that effect. And this this happens all the time. I bet you there are, and, and I know niacinamide is in lots of topical products right now because it's a very hot molecule because it's of all these amazing effects that have been proven by science. So when we look at all the claims made for products, um, you know, what is the hypothetical uh, kind of, you know, product that would get everybody interested in terms of all the current things that we have and we know out there? Well, first of all, what would I do? I'd make it a premium product make sure at least the packaging looked really expensive, even if the product wasn't particularly expensive, just so you felt you were getting something really special. So, you know, I'd get my marketers working on the product uh, packaging because the packaging is really important. But the actual constituents, I'd have something that moisturizes, that has a bit of sunblock in it, that has a bit of vitamin A-based treatment in it, uh, as well as antioxidants and uh, specific vitamins such as vitamin B3, niacinamide. The only trouble is putting those all those things in a cream may not necessarily give you the effect that they all have individually 
if you take them orally or you have the specific right doses that are used in studies. So the perfect treatment on paper may not actually be the perfect treatment on your skin. One of the things that we see a lot of at the moment is labelling products as natural or organic. I'd love to get your thoughts on those types of labels. Well, it talks about providence, doesn't it? Um, so they base this, they base all their treatments on um, various uh, compounds derived from things that are grown or naturally available or abundant. But what does that mean, really? I mean, you know, I look at things like digoxin. It's a tablet that we use for heart, abnormal heart rhythms. Where did it come from? Foxglove, all right? That's natural. You know what I mean? It's so you can. These claims are there really to reassure people that they're not putting lots of horrible, disgusting chemicals on their skin that could potentially give them cancer at a later date or other freaky things could happen, I guess. So it reassures you that there's a, there's a, a decent narrative. And, and some things are good. I mean, you know, that are organically derived or derived from plant-based uh, products, such as having, there are some moisturizers that are oat-based, for example, have oat extracts. Oats have been used for thousands of years in baths to have a kind of moisturizing effect. So, you know, so it's like most things. There's a, there is a, a good basis of truth for a lot of these products, but it's um, part of it is also just marketing to the demographic that really wants that kind of product, if you see what I mean. Yeah, it's understandable. There's a lot of people that want, you know, they, they care what they're putting on their skin. And I think that's very uh, reasonable. And, and it's right to think about what you're putting in your skin. It's just, yeah, I think you're right in saying that natural or organic isn't necessarily the best way of making that making an informed decision particularly as I don't think they're they're very strongly regulated terms I think you have to make a distinction though because I think natural is very different to yeah. organic and a lot of people buy organic products not necessarily because they think it's going to have a better impact on their skin but for ethical reasons because they don't want to be buying products yeah. that have fed into an industry that is relying on you know pesticides and it might be for environmental reasons that they're buying organic products not because they're worried about the impact on their skin and i think sometimes people buy natural products because they think if something is sourced in nature it's going to be better for their skin. But as we know, nature contains an awful lot of toxins. So that isn't always the case that something that's natural will be better for your skin. But I think we have to be mindful that lots of people make these decisions not based necessarily on their own appearance, but on what sort of industries they want to be supporting. Nina, I completely agree with you. That's that's a very good point. And I, I would really like to think that products would be promoted and the fact that they're sustainable organic not tested on animals yeah, that those are things that i would love to see on packaging you know no, no environment was damaged no animals were harmed and it's just this product delivers on what it promises would be my ideal me personally as a consumer uh, and i'm sure a lot of people feel that way well there's one last term that i'd love to cover and that's our namesake you probably guessed it dermatologically tested what can you tell us about that oh my giddy art where do we start with this one can I just, uh, by way of explanation for the slightly bemused people wondering why why Bab is going off on one again, is the fact that one of my roles is uh, to support the British Skin Foundation, and uh, we look at uh, you know various companies come along with their products, and they ask us to review the research that was done on the product. So we look at the product, and it might be something like a, I don't know, like a wet wipe or something like that. And so we go review review all their products. And and so the definitions of dermatologically tested, and Nina, by all means, please butt in if you, if you want to, because I know you've done a lot of work on this. Dermatologically tested often refers to the fact that these things don't cause irritation or allergy in humans. In a sample volunteers of, you know, of adults in a group of, say, 100 people. So dermatologically tested is one thing. Uh, you see that in a lot of products generally, and it means that it's uh, tested so it doesn't, doesn't do harm. I think what you're referring to might be dermatologically tested in terms of it does a lot of benefit or, or maybe the two get conflated. So, yes, your cosmetics been tested to make sure it doesn't harm you. So it's dermatologically tested. But is it dermatologically tested to show that it actually can deliver on the claims made? I got an abstract of a presentation that was made at the BAD's uh, annual meeting uh, a few years ago, which does dig into exactly what dermatologically tested means. And what they found was that, unfortunately, because it has no set meaning, the companies are understandably 
come up with, with what it means to them. And so they contacted a load of companies who had the term dermatologically tested on their packaging. Of these, 25 companies responded. Four didn't give any information on testing. 14 of the 25 said that they undertook patch testing. So that's a, a form of allergy testing on the skin. Yeah. 13 said that they had a dermatologist involved in the testing at some point. Five said that the product had been tested on human skin, but provided no further information. And in terms of the number of people tested, well, they didn't all give information on that, but it varied from 20 to 50 volunteers. So that sort of gives you a good insight, uh, which the consumer group also uh, did a survey of a thousand people on this. And they found that there was... As we found, there was a lot of head scratching on this. Uh, 22% of those surveyed thought that the claim meant that it would not cause allergies. 13% thought it meant that the product was kind to the skin. And 10% thought the product was less likely to cause allergies than a product without the claim. So that's interesting, I suppose, because people, people aren't necessarily taking it to mean that this product's going to be super effective. They are sort of taking it a, as a sort of quality assurance that it, it's not going to be as damaging to your skin. Hmm. But... My viewpoint, and maybe I'm being charitable, I don't know, but I feel that from for the companies themselves, they could probably do with a situation where it was just a bit more agreement on, on what it actually meant uh, because then consumers would find it useful. And if, if consumers find it useful, then I guess they're more likely to, to buy your product. Yeah, because presumably just by default, by having got to market as a product that can be used on the skin, it is going to have to have had a degree of testing that means that pretty much anyone can say they're dermatologically tested. Pretty much, actually, there are safety standards you have to go through and there are dosages of uh, chemicals within products that have to be below set parameters as prescribed by the EU, looking at European products. And th these companies will go to, they'll use the most strict uh, guidance so they can market one product along as big a territory as possible. I think dermatologically tested for safety would be a better way of putting it rather than dermatologically tested full stop because, yeah, it's open to quite a bit of interpretation and nuance and it's a bold claim to make. Mm. And actually, I think it would be reassuring for people to know that it relates to safety because for a product to get to market, it, they go through huge amounts of safety testing. There are very few, you know, things don't get onto market if they contain toxins or are unsafe. They just don't. Um so it would be reassuring for consumers to know that that is the case just with this kind of a label and remove, remove some of the ambiguity about whether it actually might or might not relate to the product claims that are nothing to do with safety. I think they're missing a trick, to be honest, by not, by not putting it in that way. But um, then again, I'm, I'm not head of a multinational corporation that deals with this. I'm sure they've got wiser people than me. I refuse to believe that, Bav. Well... Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your insights with us and your expertise. It's been really illuminating. I think there's so much useful stuff that I will have to take on board and get into those good habits you talked about. Um, I hope that people at home found it as helpful as I did. Thank you very much for having me, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much, Bav. It's been brilliant to talk to you. Cheers, Nina. For everybody at home, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Dermatologically Tested. We were talking with Dr. Bav Shergan. Nina, were there any particular favourite parts that you had? Do you know, I found it all really interesting, actually. I quite like the sound of this miracle cream that he thinks everyone over the age of 40 should be using. I'm going to tap him up later, see if he can send me some. Um, apart from <laughs> that, I just, I just think it was really interesting to learn about the importance of knowing what concentrations you've got in things you buy over the counter. So don't just get sucked into the latest buzzword. You know, measure things up against the science to make sure you are actually getting what you think you're getting for me i think the importance is definitely going to be on forming those good habits that we talked about daily moisturizing that's an easy one for me i think i think i can i can add that into my routine without too much drama to be honest it's the only thing that i currently do so it was good to know that i'm on the right track and i can ignore everything else and throw away all the dusty bottles that are littering my bathroom uh, once and for all and just stick with a moisturizer sounds good to me I do think it's going to be helpful for me in that regard. I think our cosmetics budget in our household might go down a little bit and we may get reclaim a little bit of space in the bathroom. When you say we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I think most of the good habits I'm fairly good at. 
I think I, I, I tend to stay on top of the sun sunscreen and out of the sun anyways these days. And, and as I said, I, I don't smoke. I think that the antioxidants thing is, is interesting to help undo some of the damage done. I've actually just pulled up Google because I did mean to ask Bav what sort of foods and so on are best for antioxidants. But being the slightly ham-fisted interviewer that I am, I actually never got around to coming back to that topic. So I did a quick search and pulled up an article on antioxidant superfoods. Now, please bear in mind, this wasn't particularly thorough research. So if you are looking to boost your dietary antioxidant intake, make sure to look into it yourself. Um, so they recommend purple, red or blue grapes. I assume they don't just mean wine. Blueberries, red berries, nuts, dark green veggies, broccoli and spinach, for example. And then sweet potatoes and orange vegetables. Okay, yeah, that's all manageable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can cope with all of that, I think. Like I say, it's fairly low-level Google research, but uh, so do your own. But yeah, that's, that, that seems manageable. Yeah, that does seem manageable. Good. And that's kind of consistent with healthy foods for a healthy lifestyle anyway, isn't it? It's nothing mind-blowing there. So I guess well, it's exactly. the whole thing of, you know, support a healthy body to support healthy skin where possible. Exactly. Actually, Matt, while you're talking about um, Googling things and web resources, another website that's worth mentioning is the Cosmetic Toiletry and Perfumery Association. Um, it's CTPA. They are the voice of the UK cosmetics industry, and they have actually got a wealth of information on their website about things like product labeling, what um, products can claim, um, ingredients, things like that. So if you did want to find out more and have a bit more of a deep dive, that might be a website that's worth visiting. That's ctpa.org.uk. Yeah, that's a great idea, actually, because I feel like we only really scratched the surface on that one. Well, um, next week we'll be talking about adult acne, which I think is going to be a very popular topic. Because I know a lot of people that struggle with that. So I'm really looking forward to that. If you don't want to miss an episode, make sure you follow us. You can also find us on Twitter at DermTested and on Instagram at the same handle. In the meantime, look after yourself, look after your skin, and hope you'll tune in in two weeks' time.